Yeah, so I got radically saved back in 84, dove right into the, into the ministry. And one of the gifts that God gave me, I guess, I mean, it's like, okay, people tell me this is it, is, is evangelism. And uh, I just never really thought or even considered asking God for the gift. It just, it just was in me. I, I, I still remember the very first question that the guy who led me to Christ, he asked me, so, so what do you think? After I prayed, I said, I think I need to tell my parents about this. Just immediately... I wanted to let other people know. I wanted to let my family know, the people that I knew the most and, and loved the most. I wanted to share Christ with them. And, and that's the thing, guys. That's the thing about Christianity. Christianity is a very personal faith, but by no means is it a private one. By no means. Following Christ by definition by the one that you claim to be following, involves telling people about Jesus. It involves sharing your faith, proselytizing, if you want to call it that, but that just seems like such a scary word. It involves telling people about Jesus. And there's simply no escaping the fact that following Jesus is to obey his commandments. And if you take a look at some of the things Jesus commanded, I mean, that is significant. You take a look at um, Mark chapter 8. I think I got Mark 8 to come up there. Boom. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Well, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? H heavy words. I mean, you know, I've, I've heard it said, and, and I believe this to be true, that salvation is free. Jesus paid it all, right? He paid it all. Salvation is free. But following Christ, being a disciple of Christ, well, that's, that's going to cost you everything. But it's such a unique cost because you pay that cost and you seem to get so much more in return. It's like, I mean, why, why do I feel like I'm the one benefiting <laughs> by giving my life over to Christ? Well, you are. The benefit is all yours. Uh, you know, of course, among Jesus' last words on earth, and we talked about this during our adult uh, Sunday school, among Jesus' last words on earth, his, his standing orders for Christians, you know, what are we to be losing our life, if you will, doing, is this thing called the Great Commission. And many of you guys know this Great Commission, where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Jesus establishes who's in charge here. <laughs> Jesus is in charge, okay? And he says, therefore, since I've got all authority, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Wow. Jesus commanded his followers from then to now to tell other people that he's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's it. He's the Savior. He's the only one. We've only got one, and Jesus is it. And we're to tell people about this. Tell people that that the means to forgiveness of sins and, and discovering and obtaining eternal life is found in Christ. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad that we've got a good news to share with people. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's phenomenal to hear. And, and, and that's the message we have to bear. It's a very powerful, life-giving message. And uh, the Apostle Paul, he certainly believed this. When, uh, you know, when Jesus saved his soul, he took Jesus' words seriously. The Apostle Paul, he wrote uh, in Romans 10, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call 
on the one they have not believed in. And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear unless, or without someone preaching to them? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard about uh, the message is heard through the word about Christ. Yeah. And it should be rather intuitive to us that the truth is Jesus is the only way to be saved. Uh, Peter makes that very clear to us if we aren't catching it in the rest of the scriptures. You know, Peter just kind of laid it out there to the Jews of his day and to us today in Acts 4.12 when he says, Salvation is found in no one else. It's found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I mean, Jesus is it. He's the ticket. That's it. And, and the truth is, we need saving. It's kind of implied. To have a Savior means you need to be saved. Uh, all these verses we, we, we looked at and the ones we'll continue to look at, it, it just implies that there's a problem. There's a problem with us, and we need to be saved from our problem. Right? It implies that. And this problem is so serious, we can't fix it ourselves, which really grates at the you know, human nature. I, I mean, we've got this natural pride thing going on, and to think that I can't fix it myself bothers me. But this problem is too big for me. I can't handle this problem. And it's so serious that God himself had to become a person, Jesus Christ, and intervene. He had to actually become a, a human being and, and, and suffer at the hands of humanity, be tortured mercilessly, and die on a cross in order to save me from this problem. Oh my goodness, people, what's the problem? <laughs> what, what is it that God himself had to come in to clean it up? Well, Jesus warned us of our problem over and over again when speaking uh, to his disciples about the end of the world, Jesus uh, shared with them this heavy news. He says, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow, we don't want to be... Uh, one that causes uh, those who do evil on that day. Uh, again, Paul affirms this. He says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, and 9 that he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and the majesty of his power. Wow. Wow. That's pretty bad. I mean, you, you kind of, you know, again, I mean, the, the, the realities of hell are so difficult, you just don't want to talk about it. But that's the reality. That's the problem, and that's why we need a Savior. That's why the gospel is such good news. <laughs> I mean, it's ab uh, really good. It's kind of almost too weak of a word. It's like absolutely, incredibly fantastic news. I mean, it is Awesome news. I, what, how, what kind of English word can we come up with to describe the magnitude of the gospel that rescues us from this? I don't think it's, it's possible. And, and we have a responsibility with this message that God's been given to us to help people avoid that. I mean, that's the, that's the, the, the harsh reality. You know, hell is real and, and real people go there. That's the harsh reality. And, and yet, it's, it's also a reality that you don't have to go there. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't have to go there. Jesus made it clear it was, hell was made for the devil and his angels, not for us. You know, we don't belong there. People don't belong there. Uh, Jesus, he uh, makes this painfully clear when he says, whoever believes 
in the Son is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Yeah, yeah, the truth is, everyone who claims to be a Christian disciple is on a mission to spread the message that can save the world. We're the ones that can save the world. You know, it's not Greenpeace. Appreciate some of the stuff they do, but they're not going to be able to save the world. That job has been given to us. How can anyone, how can anyone who understands these truths and claims to be a follower of Christ not share the new life? with anyone and with everyone that they can. I mean, why would you not? It's kind of like this is a holy burden that God's people bear, this penetrating concern for the welfare of people's souls, both, both in this life and in the, in the one to come. That, that's what it means to live in light of eternity when you realize that your decisions now have eternal consequences. That's living in light of eternity. Uh, there's this guy, I trust many of you may know, Bill Bright, who was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. He, he said, if you're ever going to do anything for Christ and his kingdom, do it now. <laughs> Now's your time. This is it. Do it now. Invest into eternity now. Uh, there's this uh, uh, pastor in the Great Commission Church. It's called Herschel Martindale. He's been... He's been the pastor of the, this movement longer than anyone else. And uh, he said that Bill Bright personally asked him the question, uh, if every Christian was doing what you're doing now, would the world get reached in your generation? He said the, that question devastated him. Because he realized, even as a pastor, that if everyone was doing what he was doing, there's no way the world would ever get reached. And it broke him. And God really used that moment in his life to direct him towards this radical band of believers who had the audacity to believe that God wanted them to participate in fulfilling the Great Commission. That's what really drove him to this movement. And here he is, this old guy in a wheelchair, still heading out to the Philippines, you know, leading people to Christ and running Bible studies. It's like, whoa, I tell you, that guy is experiencing a full life. Yeah. Kristen, like my wife, she likes to share a story, you know, so it's Bill Bright, Herschel Martindale, Kristen. How it goes in my world. <laughs> Maybe Christmas first. Um, but she likes to share the story about how after she put her faith in Christ at, at Iowa State, she was there and she got led to Christ, how the very next day the person that led her to Christ said, well, let's go out sharing at the uh, Memorial Union. Very next day. I, you know, it's like, don't, don't I don't need to go through some exhaustive training first or something? I mean, that's a pretty big deal. But the very next day, they went out, and they started sharing. She cut her teeth. She's been imprinted with this notion that it, it's, it's part and parcel of being a believer. If you're going to be a disciple, you're going to be engaged in the gospel. That's just, it just comes with the package. And, uh, and that's how she entered into you know, this, this Christian faith, is, is being out there, initiating with people and talking to them about Christ. You know, you, you hear stories like that. It's like, you know, that, that's almost like the Bible. I didn't know that happened anymore. But in the Bible, they did these radical things as well. Uh, uh, Paul said to the church in Philippi, in all my prayers, thanks, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I mean, this, this kind of thing's been going on since the first century, and it's not stopped, and there's no sign of it stopping. I, you know, I don't care what the government might try. There's no sign of this stopping. God's people 
have this, this unction, this burning passion, this hunger, this desire, this, this love. Let's just call it this love. A burning love to tell other people about Jesus Christ and, and, and see their, their eternity translated, crossed over from death to life. There is no greater joy on earth than to see someone ask Christ into their life. It's an incredible, miraculous thing. And so, you know, Paul, he, he it was one of those guys who immediately after salvation and, and, well, also after the scales fell from his eyes and he could see, started preaching. You know, he was one of those guys. Immediately he started preaching. And, and, and you know, the, the, the Christians in Jerusalem, they, they were being persecuted and hunted down and killed, but they wouldn't stop. <laughs> they wouldn't stop telling people about the gospel. I mean, how could they? They, I, they knew very visibly. It was in their lifetime that Jesus came and he died on the cross and the Holy Spirit came and, and they knew what Jesus did. They knew what was at stake here. How could they be quiet? Even at the risk of their own lives, they simply could not shut up. I tell you, if you've been in the kingdom for very long or, or if you've read much of the Bible, you know these things. The things that I'm telling you is like, yeah, I, I know that. I mean, I, I've been around the block a few times. I know that. So you understand these things. And you're well aware of the consequences of, of faith in Christ or not having faith in Christ. You're well aware of these things. You're well aware of the commands to God's people, to his disciples to go. Go, therefore, make disciples. Like, yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard that before. I'm kind of on track with that. You, so, so you understand these things. And I, I understand these things. We, we feel these things. And, and yet... The hard part is not knowing that we've got this job to rescue the world. It's doing it, right? That's the hard part. I was like, you know what, tell me something I don't know. If that's the tough thing. It's doing it. It's being engaged in it in a meaningful way, in a measurable way. That's the hard part, and that's the rub, and I feel that rub. It's like, oh, we've got this, this call, this command by God to go, and, and, and the, I mean, the stakes are huge, and... And I love people. I was like, and that days and weeks and months will go by. And have I told anybody about Christ and how He died on the cross for their sins? Maybe I don't. Facebook. I might have mentioned it. Put up a post or something. You know, it's like what? It was what's going on here? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to break this down. And, and entrust to you a couple of ways that you can personally engage in the gospel even before you leave this church building. I know, that's, that's pretty crazy, isn't it? Even before you leave this church building, you could be in, engaging in the gospel. And for sure, all the way until you draw your last breath. Okay? Uh, in, in Acts 17, 17 Paul uh, it says that he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. That was their lucky day to be at the marketplace because guess who else was there? It was Paul. And, uh, and so we read these and it's like, okay, I, I, always, I always found myself you know, focusing on that one. But really, you know, his pattern was to go to the synagogue first. And so I started realizing that the best place to be sharing the gospel is at church. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you realize that. That's the best place to be sharing the gospel is with people who come to church. That's, well, you, well, you know, you see, because here's a, I think this is why, statistically, if you look at a George Barna survey, that very few Christians are engaged in the gospel. And I think the reason is, is because very few Christians know the gospel themselves. Uh, you know, they've never really responded to the gospel, and yet they call themselves Christians because, well, I, I go to church. You know, I'm a, I'm a Methodist or a Lutheran, I'm a whatever. And so they kind of think of themselves as Christians, but they've never really responded to the gospel. Uh, we've, um, we've been on this mission there in, in, uh, in Decorah, Iowa. That's where our church is. And we're on this mission of of delivering the gospel to every household in the six counties surrounding our city. Okay? 
it's a it's a huge job and uh, it's a it's a really fun one and this and we recently did Fayette County and we would put gospel tracks uh, testimony tracks and uh, all sorts of things in in a little bags and we would put them on their doors okay and so this last effort to reach this entire county has give has re resulted in, in a larger response than any of the other counties we've been to before. We've been rather surprised by it. And, uh, and I've got one email from this guy that got a, a track, and this track had this title on it. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Okay? And the whole track was about how my family has come to Christ, each of the kids, et cetera, et cetera. And he sends me this email, and he makes it very clear, I am a Christian I, I've been involved in the church for yada, yada, yada. And he says, I got this track. And he said, I seriously disagree. Uh, like, <sighs> okay, people have this bad habit of putting the cart before the horse. I, I think they just want to see what happens. You know, put the cart before the horse. People talk about it all the time. What happens? And people do this, whether it's with theological things or anything. We've got this strange tendency. And, and it's really sad when it happens uh, in the church, where we have this notion that by going to church, that makes you a Christian. When really, you become a Christian first. You respond to the gospel. You put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ first. And then you're a part of the church. But our culture's kind of gotten that kind of switched around and so people think that they're Christians because they go to church when they've never really responded to the gospel in the first place. Therefore, the best place to be sharing the gospel is right here, <laughs> right here with each other. Because who knows if there's somebody that you have been assuming is a Christian because, because they go to church, really has never really responded to the gospel in their life. So uh, come to church and uh, start witnessing. I, I think it's, it's what Paul did. He would go to the synagogues where there's Jews and God-fearing Greeks, people who are already understanding a, a basic set of truths. They're already in a lifestyle and a habit of putting God first in their life. They just need to connect the dots. They need to stop trusting in their church attendance and start trusting in Christ's atoning blood. And so uh, go to church, share the gospel. And then, of course, there's the marketplace one. The marketplace one, for me, immediately makes me think about this store that I own in Decor. I, I bought a game store. The game exchange, it's called. And if you ever go on Amazon to buy something, like you know some video game or something, and you see the game exchange, that's us. We've got lots of stuff out there. And so the game exchange is a great place to share the gospel. I, is, you know, I own the place, so it's okay. <laughs> I'm not going to throw you out. You know, so you got that going for you. But we've got these teenagers and these 20-somethings hanging out there all the time, and inevitably something of a spiritual nature will come up. It'll just kind of be, get set, and it'll be an opportunity all over the place to share the gospel. You think about where you're at and you know where you work or where you go shopping and stuff like that and I've just started, started realizing you know something I think the point of, of, of Paul's example there is that wherever you find people that's a good place to share the gospel you know if there's people there I mean that's it that's all you need it's just people and there's, there's there, there you go you're always, sometimes we're always thinking I need to have the right situation the right time the right place if there's a person there that's a good time and place of course, you might use a little discernment on things that are going on. But nonetheless, you get the idea. You just need to have somebody around. Okay. So Jesus has clearly commanded us to go and make disciples. And there's by no means a shortage of unbelievers out there to share with. So what's our problem? Why don't we? Why don't we offer this gift of life more frequently? Well, we all know we're afraid. There's, there's this thing called fear. And, and sure, we've got these insecurities. We've got these inadequacies that make us 
fear what could happen if we said something to someone about Jesus, how they would react, what they would do, what they would say. You know, and we've got all these, these fears, real and imagined, that come up, and it just causes us to hesitate, and the opportunity slips by, and, well, it's over. You know, you, you just kind of move on. So what do you do with that? You know, I found that pep talks to overcome fear and sharing the gospel last about as long as my memory, which is not very long anymore. <laughs> it's just like, I just don't. You know, you, you hear it and you agree with it, but it doesn't take long before you're right back into the same mode of behavior as before, and you're just, you just freeze up. You just kind of get tongue-tied, and, and you're afraid, and you don't know what to say. And so... And so, I would like to offer to you all an antidote to the fear of talking about Jesus with other people, whether it's here at church or uh, at the marketplace. Yeah, an antidote to fear. The antidote is as natural and and normal as it is to be human. In fact, it uh, plays right into everyone's favorite subject, themselves, you know. And, uh, And so the antidote to overcoming fear and sharing Christ with others is to share your personal testimony. It's to share your story. I mean, you've got a life, right? Share your story with people. Uh, how Jesus has, has saved your life, how he's changed your life. And being excited about that, being proud of that fact in a good way, being proud about it. Wow, Jesus changed my life. The Apostle Paul shared his testimony at least Four times recorded in the book of Acts. You would think by the fourth time, Luke would have realized that his readers would have already known that. I've I've already heard that story. Four times it's shared in the book of Acts. Paul would resort to his personal testimony over and over and over again throughout the book of Acts. And I, I think he did that because Paul knew that his personal story His life, it's like the greatest apologetic out there. It's the most powerful witnessing tool ever, whether it was with just people who were responding positively to him or people who wanted him dead. He would use the same gospel approach. He would share his personal testimony. If if you could, like, assign a mantra to our world's mentality today, you could say that it's, that it's experience is everything, you know? Experience is everything. People just want to experience new and exciting and different things. Well, I realized something. Every true follower of Christ has had the experience of a lifetime. I mean, think about it. We've got a story of stories. We have this personal encounter with the living God who changed our lives. Our sins are completely forgiven. The person that we once were, we no longer are. And there's no other rational explanation other than God visited your life. I mean, how could you be quiet about that? You know, so I think that we've got the ultimate experience to share with the world. So then how then can you share your story? How can I share my story in a way in a way that has the, it captures the awesomeness it deserves and has the impact that you desire. Well, we need, we, we, we need to know that our personal story, we, we need to know it really well. In fact, the way I like to put it is we need to be experts at sharing our story. Okay? Even though I know you've lived your life, you were there for that, right? You were there when you lived, and you know your story, but, but sometimes when it comes time to sharing it, to communicating it, it's almost like, oh, where should I begin, you know? I was born a young kid, you know? We can start getting weird with it. So you actually need to practice sharing your story so that it can come off in a very smooth and understandable and, a, and powerful way. And, and so we, we need to be experts 
at sharing your story. You've got to grasp, get a grasp on your past, put it on paper, practice sharing it with everyone that you can, and even you can even format it into a little personal testimony track. I've done that, and I routinely run out of them because nobody is as of yet has said, I'm not interested in your personal life. I mean, everybody has at least been gracious enough to accept a track that I said, hey, I wrote the story of how I actually experienced God in my life. I, I think you'd really enjoy reading it. You know, thanks, you know. But, you know, it's like, well, here's, a, here's some random track from the International Bible Society. Here, you know, it's like that, that just seems so far removed from the personal transfer of my life and my story in this little track. And so I, uh, I run out of them all the time because nobody has, as of yet, has said no. So why, why is it that your personal testimony has this much power? Why is it that it's so well received to people? Uh, I'll give you six quick reasons why your personal testimony has so much power. The first one is embedded in the name. It's, it's personal. It's from your heart. You know, why, that's why people like Facebook. They want to kind of get the inside scoop on your life. This is personal. It's, I bet you $100 that you can share your life with more passion than you could talk about, you know, eschatology or soteriology or ecclesiology. Doctrine. I'm sure you could talk about how God has made a difference in your life with more passion than doctrine. For some people, that might not be true. But most of us, it is because it's personal and it's from your heart. Also, too, you've got credibility with your audience. I mean, you're an expert on your own life, right? You know, you lived your life. Nobody else did it for you. And so you know it and you've got Instant credibility. You know, you start talking about, I don't know, creationism or something, and people's like, well, who are you? You know, do you have a degree or something? And so all of a sudden, your words are not as powerful because they're considering the source. Well, consider the source. You're talking about your life. You have credibility. And no one can deny its reality. You tell them, hey, Jesus Christ changed my life. Well, no, he didn't. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, he did. No, no, he didn't. Um, I was there for that, and he did change my life, you know. So you can't deny its reality with any staying power. Uh, four, it's a non-threatening way to share the reality of Christ. You're not telling them that they need to do the same thing yet. You're telling them what God has done in your life. You're kind of baiting the hook. So it's a non-threatening way to share about Christ, his deity, his power to forgive sins, in a real person's life. It's my life. I'm not talking about some biblical character here. This is me. It uh, reveals what God is doing today in the here and now. This is not, you know, 2,000 years ago stuff. This is right here, right now. God's changing lives today. That gives it power. And the last thing is that it can be adapted to speak to the immediate needs of the people you're talking to. You can approach your story. I mean, everyone's life, the older you get, the more interesting your life gets. And you've got all sorts of directions that you can approach your life story from. And so, you know, depending on the audience you're talking to, you can approach your life story from different angles. And, it get, and, and so that makes it more adaptable. All right, now, okay, so, so it's got power. Okay, we'll give you that. How should I share it? How should I organize my personal testimony? I encourage people to use the best outline. I mean, seriously, why would you not want to use the best outline, right? Okay, the best outline is this. B, before you were saved, you start talking about your life before Christ came into the picture. What were you like? What, what were some of the things that showcased your life? What was, what was the main themes of your life and your behavior? What were things that happened to you or things that you did? Your life before you were saved. Then E, Events leading up to salvation. There was something, especially when you look back, hindsight being 2020, you, all, you start to realize, whoa, I can now see how this event led to this event and this event and this event, and I heard the gospel and I responded to Christ. 
And so E is events that God sovereignly permitted and, and moved in your life to bring you to a point of S, salvation day. That's the day that all the dots got connected. That's when you realized, okay, Jesus didn't die on the cross so that I had to go to church on Sunday. He died on the cross so that I could have a personal relationship with him because my sins are forgiven and his Holy Spirit's in me. And you responded to Christ. And you put your faith in Christ. That's salvation day. And then T is today. How's that affected your life? How's that made a difference in your life? How has having Christ in your life made your life better, more satisfying, more fulfilling? Let me give you an example. I'll share with you my testimony. So, you know, I uh, grew up on a very uh, stable, church-going family, rural family, lived on a farm, milked cows all the time. And uh, we would always go to church every Sunday. In fact, if we didn't go to church, we would have it at home. I mean, we were just very into being spiritual. And, uh, and so I grew up with no animosity towards God, no uh, bad or negative church experiences. It was just a part of my life. Well, I have to amend that. It was a part of my Sunday morning. Because after Sunday morning, eh, God just wasn't quite there. In fact, I didn't want him to be there. I mean, there was a lot of things that a young kid wanted to do, and God didn't fit the picture of what I wanted to do. So even though I would readily uh, uh, admit that I believed in God and would go to church all the time, outside of Sunday morning, I just didn't want God around. He was an inconvenience. And so I grew up with all my brothers and a couple of sisters, and I went off to Iowa State. Now, going off to Iowa State opened up new opportunities for me. I had three opportunities in mind. I had a job. I wanted to get a job so I could have money. I wanted money so that I could buy alcohol and so I could have sex. That was my mission in life. I mean, you know, all the things I couldn't quite do because my mom and dad were there, I could now do. Oh, did I go to church on Sunday? Yep. Went to church on Sunday and left him there and did all the things that college students do. Well, as God would have it, I moved into a dorm where the guy right across the hall from me was a really weird Christian. I mean, the guy would read his Bible. Yeah. And there was one time I went into his room, and he was reading his Bible, and I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm reading the Bible. I said, why? He said, well, it's my life. And that was so weird. And, I mean, I just couldn't compute, and so I left. But these guys were the nicest guys on the floor, unlike my roommate. He was the antithesis. He was the guy that helped me experience some of the worst events of my life and in the name of fun. And, uh, and so I had this black and white right here in front of me. And so the Christian guy, he invited me to this uh, Bible study on Wednesday. And uh, that was kind of similar to something I would do at church, so I would go. He'd also invite me to a Bible study on Friday. <laughs> that was not happening. So I, I was going to this Bible study, and one night after this Bible study, the leader came up to me and he said, Hey, uh, Tim, do you know for certain that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven? Well, of course, I, I didn't know for certain. I told him I don't. I, Nobody can really know that for certain until you like actually die and you're standing before God and he kind of gives you the thumbs up, thumbs down. And he said, well, actually, did you know that the Bible was written so that you could know for certain that you have eternal life? Well, no, I didn't know that. I never really read the Bible, like for real. I mean, he could have said, well, did you know the Bible says that there are Martians on, on, on Mars? I, I was like, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know. I never read the Bible. So when he told me that, it was all news to me. And he said, well, would you like to hear about it? And I go, well, yeah. So we set up a time, and he came up to my dorm room with a friend, and, and he laid out this diagram that just, it, it, it just kind of put together this structure of God as a loving and holy God on one side, and man being very sinful and independent, rebellious, and, and it was just like me. And, uh, and how there's nothing that I could do that could bridge the gap between me and God. 
they, they shared with me about uh, this verse that said that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, I had heard about Jesus Christ all my life, but I'd never done anything about it. And he explained to me that if I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, then I'll be saved. It doesn't happen as a result of going to church. It happens as a result of me responding to Christ. Well, I never knew I was supposed to do something about Jesus. And so that night, I realized that the things that they were sharing with me, I had never done. And so I asked Christ to come into my life. I prayed with those guys, and in my, you know, just infantile understanding, I put my trust in Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. Changed my life. I mean, I, I went to uh, college as a geology major. But by the time I graduated in geology, I was far more interested in the rock of ages than the age of rocks, you know? And so I went into the ministry instead of an oil well out in the middle of the Mediterranean or somewhere. They send geology majors who just have a bachelor's degree. You don't have a lot of options. But for me, it was ministry. It was clear. I wanted to be engaged in this great work that saved my life. And, uh, and so that's what I did, and I'm doing that today. It's been a wild ride. That's my testimony. I have an assignment for you. To this week, you get a piece of paper, and you write out your personal testimony. Get it down on paper. Think it through. Think through the series of events. What are the big rocks? What are the things you really want to focus on? Try to be able to get it in such a way that you could share it in about five minutes. And if you do that, Dan has assured me he will give you the opportunity to share it on a Sunday morning. <laughs> it's not as bad when you actually have the piece of paper there. And I did this at church, at my church, and I, I, I gave him the same assignment, and it was awesome to see some guys who were like, you know, you know, and they would go up there and they would read their story of how God changed their lives, and it was absolutely encouraging, and it gave them experience and practice sharing their story so that when they were at Walmart or wherever, they ran into friend X, they could actually share their testimony and not be all awkward about it. You see, what I find is that most Christians are not ashamed of the gospel. I find that most Christians are ashamed that they're not sharing the gospel more often. And it just doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to go through this exhaustive gospel training seminar before you have the right to share the gospel. Now, I do encourage going through an exhaustive gospel training seminar. But don't wait for that before you can share the gospel with somebody. You can share it by sharing your story, sharing your personal testimony. To just act like a disciple. Be an expert with your personal testimony. Write it down on paper. Share it with others. Maybe make a track out of it. And do your part in saving the world. That's what I want to do and trust to you guys. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much that you have called us to such a great and noble purpose as this. I mean, I would have been fine with just you saving my soul and, and forgiving me of my sin. and You know, I, I would have been fine with that, just knowing that I'm going to go to heaven. That's great. But you said, oh, I'm going to give you a purpose in life that is so much bigger than you. It's going to require faith. And you get to cooperate with me in this great commission of, of taking the gospel of salvation to the whole world. Really, to save the world. <laughs> and I just, I just want to say thank you, Lord. I, yeah, it's scary. Yeah, it, may, it requires losing my life, but I'll just be playing video games otherwise. Here it is. I can actually see things happen that connects me with the divine. I can see uh, miracles happen in front of my own eyes. Oh, Lord, there there really is no greater life than on the one that leads to heaven. And you have called us on it. And I want to ask you to uh, bless every person in this church. 
oh God, fire us up. The motivation is clear. The means can be much more difficult. We now have our personal testimony. I pray that every person here will write it out, will think it through, will practice it, will share it on a Sunday morning, share it with each other. What God has done to save your life. It's a powerful thing. And I just, uh, I just ask you, God, to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.